Direction, action, narrative description, or just plain description. Whatever you call it, this element of a screenplay describes everything we see and hear in a story that isn't dialogue. That could mean describing the settings, characters, actions, or sounds in a scene, and may even include a bit of technical description if absolutely necessary for the story. Of all the elements in a screenplay, the description looks and reads the most like a novel, which is why many new writers never even realize it has its own quirks and rules that need to be followed, or at least understood to be broken effectively. Like scene headings, description uses the same margins as your overall page. Description is always written in the present tense because that's how we experience movies and TV shows. Even flashbacks are experienced linearly after a time jump. Narrative description is written in mostly standard capitalization, though we'll cover what needs to be all capped over the next few videos in this series. Generally, description uses double line spacing before each paragraph. There is a trendy single line version called action stacking, but that's not something you need to worry about at this point. Just like a novel, description is broken into paragraphs, and as a general rule, each paragraph should describe one beat of action. This scene from Breaking Bad starts with the Winnebago crash. The Winnebago comes roaring over a berm and down into a deep gully. Too deep. Bam. The front bumper bottoms out, burying itself. The rear wheels spin air. Then Walt bursts out of the Winnie in a gas mask. The engine cuts off. Silence again. The Winnie's door kicks open and out stumbles Underpants Man. He yanks off his gas mask, lets it drop. Then he takes that off, giving us our first good look at him. He's 40 years old, receding hairline, a bit pasty. He's not a guy who makes a living working with his hands. He's not a guy we'd pay attention to if we passed him on the street. But right now, at this moment, in this pasture, right now, we'd step the fuck out of his way. Then Walt realizes the RV's done for and hears sirens in the distance. Underpants man looks at the RV. End of the line for that. He listens hard. Out of the silence, we hear sirens. These are two different individual actions, but one action beat, Walter realizing he's run out of good options. So he picks a bad one and heads back into the danger of the Winnebago. They're faint, a few miles off, but growing louder. Our guy knows he's boned with a capital B. He holds his breath and leaps back inside the RV. Five action beats, five paragraphs of description. But differentiating one action beat from another isn't always an easy task. Vince Gilligan could have used separate beats for Walter assessing the state of the Winnebago and hearing the sirens. But that may have made it feel like Walt was working through the problems one at a time, rather than feeling like the situation is overwhelming and desperate. Or he could have shortened Walt's description and tacked it onto the end of the beat where he bursts out of the Winnie. But again, it wouldn't feel as chaotic or dire as what we get with Walt's full description. These choices are part of what creates your story's tone and pacing. They require some amount of judgment, and what you decide will have a big impact on your own personal writing style. But whatever your style ends up being, paragraphs of description should rarely exceed four lines. And it's usually a good idea to strive for as few as possible to make the beat work. As screenwriters, we can only describe what the audience will see on screen. Grant, never tearing his eyes away, reaches over and grabs Ellie's head, turning it to face what he sees. She sees it and drops the leaf. A dinosaur chewing the branches. Or what they'll hear through the speakers. Lex is eye to eye with the thing for a second. Then the dinosaur raises its head up above the car, opens its mouth wide and roars. But as you may have noticed, that doesn't mean you need to write the words we see or we hear. Readers don't need to be told how to use their imagination. Always fall back to the idea of telling a story around a campfire or at a bar. You wouldn't say we see or we hear in that context, so it probably doesn't belong in your script. But unlike campfire stories and even novels, we screenwriters don't get the chance to dive into a character's mind in our description. Voiceovers are the closest we get, but that's dialogue. We can't just tell our reader how a character thinks or feels. We have to creatively describe our scenes and carefully craft our dialogue to lead the reader to those conclusions. And our toolkit includes two basic kinds of description, setting and action. You may remember that primary scene headings should always be followed by at least a sentence of narrative description. If important pieces of the setting aren't obvious from the scene heading, the first bits of description will usually help us envision the location where the action is about to unfold. Exterior, the Great Wall, night. A massive, magnificent stone barrier snakes along the mountaintops of China. A lone guard patrols it. All's quiet. But that doesn't mean you need to go over every detail here or anywhere else in the description. You should only describe what is necessary to progress the characters, plot, or theme, and trust the reader to fill in the rest. You probably want to describe the fireplace in your story if it has the magical ability to transport your characters. Everyone is gathered in front of the large fireplace or because your characters need it to keep from freezing solid. A wood paneled room with an ornate oversized fireplace at one end. Or because it's symbolic of the passion and danger in your story. A fire is lit in the fireplace. 
the logs are blazing well. But if the fireplace doesn't really matter to the story, then don't bother describing it. Writing action description is similar. The reader doesn't need to know every detail of a character's movement or facial expressions. But if they are important to the character, plot, or theme, then include them. Even fight scenes don't need every punch and kick mapped out, but only those that change the dynamics of the fight in some way. They know they've got her until the big cop reaches with the cuffs and Trinity moves. It almost doesn't register. So smooth and fast. Inhumanly fast. The eye blinks and Trinity's palm snaps up and the nose explodes, blood erupting. What's important here is that the cops think they have her until she acts without warning to fight back. We don't need the description to detail that Trinity spins, grabs the cop's wrist, and breaks his arm with a single rising blow. Efficiency is a virtue in screenwriting. By eliminating any description that doesn't contribute to the story, we can create narratives with constant momentum. And one of the most important rules to help us achieve that efficient description is to always write an active voice. Active voice just means that the subject of your sentence is the one that performs the action. Sean sits next to him as active voice because the subject, Sean, performs the action. Sits. But with passive voice, the subject is acted upon. The seat next to him is sat on by Sean is passive voice because the subject, the seat, receives the action, is sat on. Active voice is not only more engaging and energetic, but it tends to also be more concise, making it both more efficient and easier to read. A lot of writers misunderstand active voice and assume any sentence with is must be passive. But Britta is pretending to be under as Pierce continues is still active and totally acceptable because the subject, Britta, is still performing the action, is pretending. The is here simply makes the action continuous. Britta was already pretending to be under at the beginning of the scene, whereas Britta pretends to be under as Pierce continues could mean she starts the action at that moment. But that doesn't always matter. Wildflower's blanket the grassy hill isn't continuous, but no one reading it would imagine wildflowers suddenly falling from the sky and covering the hill. The context makes it obvious they were there from the beginning of the scene. If it won't trip up a reader or set off any red flags, then don't stress about whether it's continuous or not. And as for whether it's passive voice, there's actually a quick way to check. Just look for two B words like is or are paired with past tense verbs. Britta is pretending to be under as Pierce continues has a to be word, but pretending is present tense, so the sentence is still active. The seat next to him is sat on by Sean has the to be word is, but the past tense verb sat, so the sentence is passive. If all this grammar talk is giving you flashbacks to struggles in school, don't worry. Writing an active voice will become second nature in no time. You won't have to consciously think about it for long because repeating an action over and over will quickly put you into autopilot. And while that's great for us as screenwriters trying to develop writing habits, it's unfortunately also true for the readers looking at your script. Script readers are almost always expected to get through way more scripts than is reasonable which means reading and evaluation tricks and shortcuts often begin to take root without the reader even noticing them. A particularly common habit is skimming the description. If you read enough scripts, a lot of description ends up becoming pretty predictable, and what isn't can often be picked up from the context gained by skimming alone. And when skimming does cause a reader to miss something important and leads to some confusion, it's likely the reader will just assume the writer messed something up. It's frustrating, but it's also reality. So what can we do when we need the reader to pay special attention to something they might otherwise skim or quickly forget? Like an important object, like a rifle the characters will use later in the story. Ed nods to a rifle mounted on a brace. Or a defining physical trait. The left side of his face is badly scarred around his left eye. This is Prince Zuko. Or a moment of action that swings the momentum of a scene. She bumps Hans's hand with the gun and McLean draws the Beretta over his shoulder and fires, hitting Hans in the chest. If there's a risk the reader might skim past an important bit of description, you can add emphasis by underlining or all capping the words. But this can be a bit jarring to read because it breaks the pattern of the description, which makes it good for emphasis, but not so great for readability. The reader is skimming your work because they have a pile of scripts to get through, so making them slow down to pay special attention to something can be frustrating if there isn't a particularly compelling reason to do so. So just use this technique sparingly. However, there are a few elements of description you need to know about that are always all capped which is why you should check out this video covering the most common one, character introductions.